everyone. So while you're tucking into breakfast, you get to listen to me. I'm just going to see if I've got this working right. Yes. So I'd like to open by um, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Wadjuk people of the Crowd and our nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So it's quite a privilege to speak with you all today. Um, and I have to be honest and say that I was not my first choice for doing this. So the great thing about the CEO, being the CEO is I actually get to choose themes and who gets to talk. And trust me, I was not the first choice. Um, but I was convinced, so Chris and Lizzie convinced me to come and have a chat today. And I was convinced that some of you might like to hear how I got to be the CEO of this great organisation. And if some of you happen to watch a Women in Leadership webinar for the CAA, I apologise, because you're going to hear the same stuff. But that's OK. Um, maybe just a little bit different. Now, Eleanor Roosevelt said that you have to learn from the mistakes of others because you can't live long enough to make them all yourself. So today, I'm going to give you a very personal view of my career and how I got here. And maybe, uh, just maybe, you get to learn from some of my mistakes, of which there have been many. And maybe something in my story and my experiences helps and inspires you along the way. There we go. So this year's theme for International Women's Day is Choose to Challenge. So a wise man, look at your face, once said <laughs> that it is better to be at the bottom of a ladder you want to climb than halfway up one that you don't. And gender equality and an inclusive and diverse workplace and world and celebrating the achievement of women is the ladder that we choose to climb. And today we celebrate that. So let's start with me, shall we? So unless you live under a rock, um, you know that prior to me taking the role of CEO, I was a police officer uh, with the WA Police Force for 34 years. It was a role that I held for over half of my life. But in the context of a discussion about me and how I got to be the CEO of St John, you have to understand my journey, so where I came from. So now I'm going to take you for a walk down memory lane, complete with pictures, you'll see everything, fat, skinny, dark hair, long hair, all sorts of things. Um, I'll take you for that walk down memory lane. And I think about how I started in WA Police, and that was on July the 2nd, 1984. So a long time before a lot of people in this room were even born. Um, I, a very young, wide-eyed, naive, but enthusiastic Michelle Langley, walked through the front doors of the WA Police Academy. But my journey to get to that point was a little bit different. Um, for some, but not for everyone. Um, I'm a child of a broken home, um, and a home that was plagued by mental illness, alcohol and drug abuse, and family and domestic violence. Um, I have my mum, who I love very, very much, but she's more than just a little bit crazy. She's pretty crazy. And the craziest thing she ever did was she married my dad. And my dad um, was a writer and a poet and a gambler, a alcoholic, a con man and a criminal. And my childhood was not one of privilege, in fact it was quite the opposite. I grew up in Balga, went to Balga Senior High School and I spent most of my weekends visiting my father in prison. And I left school at 15 to start my working life after watching my dear old mum work every day of hers to feed, clothe and educate my sister and myself. My mum taught me many things, um, but I think the most important was the value of hard work and of perseverance, of never giving up. She sacrificed everything, my sister and I. So here is also where I mentioned that that first job that I left school for was to sell lady shoes and it's where I developed a lifelong passion, my husband would say obsession, um, with shoes. And my philosophy, ladies, or even gents in the room, is you can never have too many pairs and when in doubt, just buy the shoes. <laughs> so here's a blast from the past, got a lot of the 70s. 
Um, so my dad was a charming rogue, um, but with a dark side, and he had a callous disregard for his family and for his loved ones. And that's a terrible thing to have to say, but it's the truth. And he was always in search of something else, the next big thing, and he used any means he could to get it. And to this day, I don't know what he was looking for, but it certainly wasn't a wife and two daughters. And he lived a life that was so distant from us in a circle of crime figures, of drugs and alcohol. But sadly, he drew us into that circle far too often, and my mother just couldn't break the bond with him. She just loved him. She eventually divorced him, but the link remained right up until his death in 2002. Now, perhaps because of that childhood, because of what I've grown up in, what I've seen, it actually put me on the path to police. Because I wanted to be one of the good guys. I didn't want to be one of the bad guys. So it was a choice that led me to that first day as a police officer where I was one of 12 women in a class of 84. And unlike paramedicine or any of the, the health streams, policing still struggles to attract women to policing, even in 2021. And in 1984, which, well, for some of you is a lifetime ago, um, we were an absolute novelty. And interestingly, um, when I was being issued with my accoutrements, so my bits and pieces at the academy, my male counterparts got batons and all of the things that you would associate with policing. And I got a handbag and some beautiful gloves, some high heel shoes and 20 pairs of stockings. So wherever we were stationed, we were either the first woman to be there or the, you're absolutely the only woman in the workplace. With my graduation photo, and good luck if you can pick me out, um, might give you a prize if you reckon you can. But I could even find myself when I was putting this together. So I reflect that I was part of the business of policing for over 30 years, but it is only in this last decade of my working life that I see open and frank discussion on a national level, and particularly at the moment, about sexual assault and family violence against women and children. Issues such as these, along with, along with my upbringing, have framed the type of leader that I am. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about my career path and experiences. So in 1986, I was doing general duties policy, which is, you know, just driving around in the van, seeing what we could stumble over. And I was given the opportunity to go and work in plain clothes uh, um, with the detectives, and they were the cool guys. They were the really cool guys. Um, they're the ones that they make TV shows about. And uh, I was given an opportunity to work in a number of areas, major crime, the child abuse unit, and in drug school. And in 1987, I decided that I didn't just want to be a, a, a plain clothes officer, I actually wanted to be a detective, which was kind of, you know, out of the, um, out of left field, because the number of detectives in WA police at that time was in single digits. And they were kind of, um, tolerated as opposed to encouraged. But the late 80s was a time when it was being recognised that women detectives um, were actually an asset and they were good for doing a lot of things, not just talking to rape complainants or making coffee while the boys did the hard work. We actually were pretty good at doing our job. So I was accepted and I was put through a four-week detective training school. So here's another blast from the past. That's, I think that's the era of the perm. Um, so that's my detective training um, photo. And it's interesting, there's a number of people in there that um, uh, have been to prison. Um, they're not police officers anymore. There's, it's a real rogues gallery. And when I found that photo, I was like, oh, it's an interesting group. So um, I actually ducked that course. And my male counterparts were not actually happy with that. They were really happy while we were studying that four weeks that I put together all the study notes, that I got all the study groups together, that I um, made sure that we all passed because it was, you know, we were a team, we wanted to pass. So they were really happy with that. Um, and these guys were my friends. My friends, my, um, 
your brothers in arms, um, you know, my mates. But they were really unhappy when I beat them at something. And for me, that was a really early lesson. And it was a lesson in the fact that not everyone will be as happy about your success as what you are. And you should never, ever let them bring you down. I actually felt guilty for um, being ducks. And I look back now and I think, I really shouldn't have felt like that. But there you go. So I was a detective at that point for 11 years. Um, and I worked all over the place, burn detectives' offices, and then once again I went to the child abuse unit. And I have to say my time at the child abuse unit is probably the most satisfying of my policing career in some ways. Um, now the subject matter is terrible, it's absolutely awful, and it can be a very heartbreaking and traumatising place to work. But the other side of that coin is that I can honestly say that every day that I went home from work, I know that I made a difference. And I know that I made a difference in some child's life. And I know that I had accomplished something. And very few occupations actually give you that on a daily basis. Now personally, not a good term there, um, along the way I got married and got divorced. Um, and then I got married again and I took responsibility for two beautiful stepdaughters, Elise and Beth. And it was around about this time that I kind of um, lost my mind and decided that I wanted to be a mother as well as a stepmother. But to be clear, I still wanted my career, so I wanted it all. Um, so whilst I was at the child abuse unit, I gave birth to my daughter, Sarah. Um, I haven't got a photo of up there of you pregnant because that screen's not big enough for me to fit on. <laughs> uh, and I went from a very carefree time thinking back, of, you know, having no children and being a, um, um, a stepmom on the weekends to suddenly having a newborn and our step, my, my stepdaughters came to live with us, so a newborn and an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old. And that's when, you know, reality really hits. And um, I was overwhelmed and I tried to, I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do here. I'll tell you what, then I went back to work. <laughs> um, I returned to the child abuse unit when Sarah was six months old because, trust me, policing is ten times easier than um, being their motherhood. And I have to tell you that I realised that I, there's a reason why there's only one Sarah and she doesn't have any younger siblings because I realised that I was not cut out for that full-time motherhood. Um, and I have the greatest of respect to people that are, in fact, I'm incredibly envious of them because um, they get to experience things that I just wasn't cut out for. Um, and I just couldn't do it. I, I had to go back to work. I loved our girls. Um, they're incredible um, human beings. Uh, but I needed to go back to work. Oh, we were broke, so there was that too. <laughs> Um, but I did sacrifice my career in a sense because I realised I couldn't remain a detective and I couldn't do the things that detective work brings, which is long hours, call outs, all of those sorts of things. So I decided that my, our children needed me more than the children of the child abuse unit and I made the difficult decision to leave the operational policing arena. And I think it was by heart back to my dear old mum and her sacrifices they are ingrained in my memory and I am what I am today because of her and my children deserve that as well. So the lesson that I learned out of all of this is that you can have it all, you just sometimes can't have it all right now. And sometimes something has to give. Um, so I went to a non-operational role where I had stable hours, set work patterns, it worked for us as a family, um, but I have to say, I secretly miss the excitement of, you know, doing the detective stuff. Um, and I'm an ambit ambitious woman. And I could see things passing me by. Now, and as a side note, um, ambition is not a dirty word. And sometimes we think it is, or we treat it as. And no one should ever make anyone feel guilty for harbouring ambition. So because my ambition didn't subside, in 1999, again, I think probably, yeah, a few people still weren't even born then in this room, 
I was promoted to the rank of sergeant um, to be the gang lesbian liaison officer, and that was pretty close to one of the best jobs that I've ever had. I should say that when I got promoted, my husband um, was also a police officer. We both applied for promotion at the same time, and the details of promotion came out on his birthday. And I got promoted and he didn't. <laughs> so we had to try and figure out how to celebrate his birthday, commiser commiserate with him and celebrate me. And I have to say, he's very good. There was lots of celebrating, but yeah. Um, he got promoted the year after, so he survived. Um, so being a gay and les lesbian liaison officer was an outstanding job. It was a wonderful job. I got an opportunity to ensure that a marginalised section of the community got an equitable policing service, and they weren't getting one at the time, and it is one of those continuing battles. And in terms of equity battles, the one against homophobia, particularly in institutions like policing, um, is just as difficult, and um, it is one just as difficult, if not more so, that, than the one that seeks gender equity. So but after three years of doing that, I thought it was time for me to do something different. You can see that, you know, I do, I do like change. Um, and I was a trained investigator, and that had been my passion and my path and where I saw myself for my career as a young officer. And in you know, 2002, I was heading into my late 30s, and I wanted to, wanted to do it again before it was all too late. Um, so what amazed me at this point, though, was how now that I was a mother and I had other responsibilities, um, how many people seem to think that, A, you lose your brain with the placenta after childbirth for some reason, you just <laughs> suddenly, you dumb yourself down. And more than anything, resistance that I got from other women about going back to be on the front line. I was, I was quite taken back by that. And I wanted to get back in the game. And my argument was that if I could do it seven years earlier, I could do it again. And my skills might have needed a little bit of polishing up, but the skills were still there. You don't lose those skills. So we as women, regardless of our profession, have to reinforce the fact that you don't lose those skills. <coughs> like I said, they may need some polishing, but you don't lose them. So, with the support of my dear husband, I applied for a position as a detective sergeant at the Major Incident Group. Um, now, I should clarify for you, the Major Incident Group is, as it suggests, um, was the 24-hour response to, you know, all the stuff that ends up on the front page of the paper, murder, rape, robbery, sieges, um, all of that sort of thing. And they had never had a woman there in the 30 years, 30 plus years that they had been um, uh, in place. They had never had a woman there. And I have never really been one for doing things quietly, and so I figured if I was going to be operational, I might as well be there at the pointy end of the stick, like get out there and do it. And I had also been a loud advocate over the years for the fact that there should be women in the major incident group. I couldn't see why there wasn't. Um, my dear husband Mark um, kind of gave me um, a moment of clarity where he said, well, you've been banging on with, about this for an awful long time, you should put up or shut up on it. Either apply or shut up, just don't say anything else. I'm like, all right, so I applied. And um, I got the job. For all of that, I actually did okay. I survived. The major incident group survived the feminine invasion. So the world, world didn't come to an end as it was predicted. And that group of people that weren't so welcoming were in for a little bit of a shock. Because in 2004, I got promoted to senior sergeant, and I got promoted to senior sergeant at the major incident group, so I was their boss. And sometimes, karma does actually work out. <laughs> so, but here's a tip for people. So that decision that I made to apply for that job at the major incident group was the one that changed the course of my career. And it is the one that brought me to this place today. I was an average police officer. There is nothing special. There was nothing special about Michelle Fife. Average, not outstanding, not good, not bad. Um, hard worker, but just average. 
And by applying for that role as a major incident group and taking that opportunity, I gave myself a profile. People suddenly took notice of me. Um, my husband, Mark, um, was for the entirety of his career a very high profile police officer. And for the first time, I was suddenly um, being looked at for my skills and my abilities and not just for being Mark Fife's wife. He was now Michelle Fife's husband. <laughs> um, and he continues to be. Um, so I was promoted very quickly um, in the ranks after that because I had that opportunity. So six months after being promoted to senior sergeant, I was promoted to inspector, and six months is a really short period in policing. Um, and that was done over and above my former boss and a number of my long-standing colleagues. So you can imagine that went down really well. 18 months later, I was promoted to superintendent, two years later, commander, and then four years later to assistant commissioner, which was my final rank. I've done all sorts of pretty cool stuff. So I've run the Police Academy, Academy, I've run Human Resources and Professional Development. I've run Traffic Operations, and when I think Traffic Operations, think booth buses, speed cameras and everything that you hate. Um, I've run Specialist Services. So Specialist Services, think um, Police Air Wing, the Dog Squad, um, Mounted Police and the Water Unit. I used to describe it as everything that flies, floats or poos. You run that, that they were particularly difficult. Um, and one of my final roles in policing was as the Assistant Commissioner of State Crime. And um, State Crime is cold case homicide, homicide, um, child abuse again, sexual assault, forensic, gang crime, organised crime, drugs, um, and a few other things. And it's probably been my crowning achievement as a police officer to be in charge of State Crime when we arrested Bradley Edwards, the Claremont serial killer. And I think, well, it's not bad. Not bad for a girl who left school at 15 to go and sell some shoes. And if I think back on it, I think I've made some particularly tough choices um, with family, and particularly where family and career come, you know, sort of converge. But you know what? Um, if I think back over that very long career, because I'm getting old now, um, I, and I think back on and I reflect on it, I've, I've learned from the fact that because I am a woman and because I am a wife, because I am a mother, I bring different perspectives, different priorities, different life experiences. And that's threatening to some people. And that's fine, but it is a strength. And it's a strength that should be valued and it should be celebrated. And we should do that for all women. I know um, one of the questions, if we get a chance for questions, someone will have, will be, how do you cope with people saying the only reason you got promoted is because you're a woman? And my answer is, oh, finally. Um, finally, I get promoted for being a woman. Because being a woman is a positive. And the other thing that I've learned is they're going to say it anyway. Someone's going to find a reason for you getting promoted or getting the job or getting the opportunity. Being a woman is just an easy one for them to pick. And in the end, in everything that you do in your lives and in your careers and everything I've done in my life and in my career, it doesn't make any difference. Because it doesn't matter how you got the job, why you got the job, what happens is what you do in the job. What happens is how you succeed in the role. There's always going to be someone that's going to want to take you down and you can't listen to the haters. And you know what? The only time I've ever gotten a job where they didn't say the only reason I got it because I was a woman is this one. In 2017, I actually won the Telstra Business um, Award in the Public Service and Academia Division. And I also applied for the job as Commissioner of Police in a very confidential selection process. And you know that it's confidential because it was all over the West Australia <laughs> with my photo. Um, and with everybody else that was going for the job, the only thing I can say is that my photo was better than all of theirs. So that's all right. Um, and I was shortlisted. And I was interviewed for the job. And I didn't get it. And that's not the end of the world. Um, I was very happy as an Assistant Commissioner. Who wouldn't be? 
um, I had a great job and I had a great career. It was something that I loved. But then something interesting happened. That profile that I had in Flexing was suddenly a public profile, courtesy of the CD newspaper, um, and more public than it had been previously. Um, and I started getting approaches from recruiting firms asking if I was interested in leaving policing and leave, interested in leaving WA Police. And I have to say, it was something that I had never considered because WA Police and policing was my last work. It's where I was going to go and be until I retired. But because someone came and asked me, I actually had to figure out what it was that I loved. Was it policing or was it community service more broadly? what was going to fulfil me for the last piece of my working career. And it's interesting, as I sat back and I reflected on that, because in our own worlds, whether it be policing or paramedicine or health or you know anything, in our own worlds, we think that the world revolves around us and our issues and what we're doing right now. And if you actually take a step back and look, you realise that it really doesn't. It really doesn't. There's a whole lot more going on out there that we can contribute to and that presents amazing opportunities if you're willing to go and look. So in 2018, um, I was offered this role. I have to say two people from the selection panel sitting up front, thanks. Um, I was offered this, this role and I ended my police, policing career and I started um, a new chapter in my life. So I became the first woman CEO of St John, um, and in doing so, I actually got to join a couple of other trailblazers. So you see the photo up there with um, the CEO of the Royal Flying Doctor Service, Rebecca Tomkinson, and the CEO of the Silver Chain, Dale Fisher. Now both are first in their organisations, and they are amazing role models for women in the health sector. So <coughs> we're getting towards the end. Um, and I want to give you my views on a couple of things about leading this great organisation because it's, it's a really interesting organisation to lead and I have to say I'm somewhat uncomfortable at times with hierarchical, militaristic command and control um, structures in organisations and that's interesting considering that's normally what you would associate with my previous profession. And I can say that I understand in times of crisis that command and control piece is very, very important. But what we need to do and what I do is you have to value ideas and innovation and creativity and discussion. And you have to encourage people to argue with you. And I actually encourage and enjoy a divergence of opinion and, and robust discussion respectfully. It always has to be respectfully. I want to hear from diverse experiences, different beliefs, thoughts and attitudes, particularly from the people in our organisation, because I don't have all of the answers all of the time. I like to think I'm always right, but I am regularly wrong. And I want to hear people's opinions. I want to hear their voices. And I want them to tell me when I've got it wrong. As I look around the room at some of the people who directly report to me going, yeah, yeah, sure, she says that. <laughs> um, because I understand that sometimes that's not easy to accomplish. I know that when I'm wrong, um, and ha having to be the person to tell me that, or oh, you got that wrong, can't be easy. Because I have a relatively forceful kind of personality. I understand that. Um, and speaking truth to power is always fraught with danger. Um, and I know because I've had to do it um, in my old career and some of my old bosses, I think, were far more intimidating than what I am. Well, I think that anyway, so I don't know that, yeah. <coughs> we'll take a poll later and see what the rest of them think. So, but I, my view is that leadership is actually not about a title um, and it's not about a position and it has very little to do with organisational structure. Leadership is about action and example. And it is about one life in influencing another. It's about building capability and capacity in others and in the organisation. And I've got a lot to be very, very um, proud of 
and I've had great achievements over a nearly 40 year working career. But my greatest achievements, I reckon, are these. So my family, my daughters, my stepdaughters, amazing women, um, a wonderful husband, see he's got no hair anymore, that's what I did, um, <laughs> by my side through everything and now two beautiful grandsons to go on. Because, you know, families are the compass that guides us. They are our inspiration to reach great heights. And they are our comfort when we falter. Um, professionally and personally, I'm um, pretty happy that I broke the, the stereotype. I didn't take the path to the dark side um, that I could have as an adolescent. I didn't join the family business, so to speak. Um, I followed my dream and I made it come true. Um, because I couldn't change my beginning, but I had every opportunity to change my ending. And I want to round things off by um, telling you that my father was in prison the day um, when I joined policing, and he was actually released the day I graduated. Um, and he turned up at my graduation ceremony uninvited. And that was the last time I saw him for many, many years. Um, he wouldn't change, and I actually wouldn't compromise my values or my career. And he never came to either of my weddings, he never met his grandchildren. Uh, he went to live in the USA, Las Vegas, great place for a compulsive gambler to live, but that's where he went. Um, and returned to Australia shortly before his death in 2002. And I didn't see him, and I spoke to him only briefly before he died. Uh, and he never once apologised for what he put my mother and my sister and I through. Um, and I don't tell you that for sympathy or anything like that, um, because my story is actually nothing startling. There are a great many people um, I grew up with who had a much harder time than what I did. And they've gone on to be very successful, but there are also an awful lot who didn't. So here's a bit of final advice. Um, that may be of interest to you because um, we only get one life and you know time is the one resource they're not making any more of. So you've got to look for opportunities. Opportunities um, have been described as those things that lazy people wait um, to arrive. Dreamers hope they're going to appear. Smart people look for them and even smarter people go out there and create them. You have to do what you love. Like I said um, earlier, I actually had to figure out what that was. And you have to do something that makes you feel good when you look in the mirror every morning. You have to decide and know what's important to you and never compromise on your values. Because others are gonna determine your reputation, but it is only you that can determine your integrity. There's, you know, have a plan or don't have a plan. I didn't have a plan. It just kind of worked. Do what works for you. Um, I would encourage you to develop networks, seek out mentors, um, and never stop or give up on learning. And when in doubt, ask. There's nothing wrong with that. I ask dumb questions all day, every day. But never underestimate your skills and your attributes and your value. Other people will make you question it, but never underestimate it. Because your future is made of the same stuff as your present. And you have to seize opportunities as you see them. The easiest way is to always just say yes. Even if you don't know how to do it, figure it out later, but say yes. I'm going to give you my final quote of the day from the inimitable Dieter von Teese, who said, you can be the juiciest, ripest peach in the world, and there's still gonna be someone who hates peaches. Yeah. <laughs> so you be you, um, choose to challenge, and when someone tells you it can't be done, or more to the point that you can't do it or achieve it, remember that this is a reflection on their limitations, not yours. Thank you, and I think I have to take questions.